Hey, I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13 is our text today. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, that's perfectly fine. If you're at Sweetwater or at McCulloch, there's Bibles in the seats around you. Uh, and you can just grab one of those and turn to page 972. And if you're at our Parker campus, then uh, there's a table uh, in the back. Just go back there, grab one of those Bibles, turn to page 972, and you'll be able to join us in looking at Matthew chapter 13. And as always, no matter which campus you're at, if you're here and you don't have a Bible and you want one, uh, please take one of those. It is our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God and read the Word of God because we know if you do that, God will change your life. Hey, uh, is there anyone besides me that really hates pointless stories? A anybody? Okay, I see this. Hey, I, I grew up in church, so I heard lots of pointless sermons. And, and I hate that, uh, but uh, I try not to preach pointless sermons. And, and sometimes I confess that I encourage people who are telling a story to get to the point. So at this point, I should apologize to my wife uh, because she's the one I'm usually encouraging at that point. Uh, that's why as a child I loved uh, fables. You know, kind of the, the, the children's stories with a moral to them. Uh, I, I really enjoyed those because they had a point. So what is your favorite children's moral story or fable? Do you, do you have one? Do you have a favorite one? Uh, so how many of you know the story of the boy who cried wolf? Let's see your hands. Okay. A lot of you know the boy who cried wolf. You know, it's a story that tells you that lying is going to cost you cost you your credibility. Uh, people stop believing you when you tell lies all the time. How about Chicken Little? Any Chicken Little fans in here? Okay, lots of hands go up. I mean, can I just tell you, the sky is not falling. All right, there's people who think it is, but it's not. What about the Midas touch? Anybody, anybody familiar with the Midas touch? Okay, it's where the king, you know, wished that he could turn everything into gold, and then he touched his daughter. It, the moral of the story is, you know, be careful what you wish for, you know, because it may not be what you actually want. Or how about the tortoise and the hare. Guys, everybody knows the tortoise and the hare. Uh, you know, slow and steady wins the race, uh, except when you're driving. <laughs> so I've never been a fan of the tortoise and the hare. I'll just be honest about that. Okay, how about this is, this is going to trip some of you up. Uh, how about La Llorona? Anybody know La Llorona? Yeah, I didn't either. I got taught this one. Uh, so this is a Mexican fable that says you have to be a good child or the ghost of the wailing woman will get you. <laughs> So, uh, some of you are like, yeah, I know that one, and others are you are like me, like, I've never heard of that before. So this weekend, we are kicking off a new series, and, and the series is called The Moral of the Story. And we're going to be looking at the stories that Jesus told, uh, stories that we call parables. And, uh, and by the way, none of his stories are pointless. They all have a great point. Now, some of the stories are long, and some of them are incredibly short. Uh, but all of them will change our lives if we listen and if we understand them and if we apply them to our lives. So the very first story that we're going to look at, our first parable we're going to look at, is the story of the sower. Matthew chapter 13. Now it's kind of broken up in two parts because Jesus tells the story and then he explains the story. So let's look at it together. Beginning in verse 1, Jesus says, That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down and the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables saying, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them. And other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now jump over to verse 18, because this is where Jesus explains the parable. He says, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. 
As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. So Jesus tells us a story. And there's two components, two, you know, kind of players in the story that I want you to see. Uh, the first one is the sower. A sower went out to sow. Okay, a sower. So he went out to sow. Now, he's not the main point, but he is the actor in the story. He's the one who's too in the action. And so he's essential to the story. And by looking at the sower, I think we learn some things about God. Okay, we learn some things about God. The first thing we learn is that the sower is reckless. I don't know if you really notice this or not, but he's a little bit reckless because if the seeds that are going to produce the crop that you need to live on aren't that important to you, I mean, you're just going to throw them everywhere. I mean, you think about this. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking if I had 100 seeds and I need all of them to produce a plant, I'm not going to be scattering them on the path or, you know, in the thorns or on the rocky soil. That just doesn't make any sense to me because it seems very careless in his agricultural application. And I know that they were a, an ag agrarian society. They, they needed food to live. They needed it to be produced. So he just strikes me as being a little bit crazy or irresponsible or careless. And, and I find that interesting because obviously the sower represents God. It's the words of the kingdom. But I think this is revealing of God's heart. It's revealing God's heart. God wants everyone to hear the gospel. God wants everyone to hear the good news that there is life in Jesus. And, and so he is reckless with the seeds. God wants everyone to experience that life-changing power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, we know this because the Apostle Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 3 that God is patient toward you, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He desires that everyone would come to know him and love him. And, and of course, Jesus communicated this beautifully in what's called the Great Commission, Matthew 28, when he says, go therefore and make disciples of, what? All nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. And guess what? I'm going to be with you always, even to the end of the age. You see, God wants to reach people. And you know what that means? Let's get really practical. That means that God doesn't love us more because we're Americans. Okay, sometimes we kind of, we live in a blessed society. We've got freedom of religion. Uh, we, we've, we understand how important God's blessings are to us. But he doesn't love us more. You know, God loves Russians and Somalis and Chinese just as much as he does us. And, and God loves Pakistanis and Venezuelans and Israelis just as he, much as he loves you. That's reality. He wants people to come to faith no matter where they are, no matter who they are. And God doesn't discriminate based on ethnicity either. Revelation 5, 9. Uh, the Apostle John sees that throne room of heaven and, and the, the, there are people gathered around singing praises to Jesus. And they sing, you are worthy. Talking to the Lamb. You are worthy because you were slain. And by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. That's what Jesus did. He purchased people for God from every tribe, every language, every nation. Now, the Jews of Jesus' day did not understand this. Or they just kind of rejected it, if they did understand it. I mean, they knew that God's promise to Abraham was that through the seed of Abraham, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. But they didn't live it. They lived in what was an assumed uh, special status before God. They, they really embraced that idea. We're God's chosen people, and he doesn't care about anybody else. He only cares about us. And they demonstrated that by the way they treated the Gentiles, why they treated other people. They just looked down on them and said, hey, we're loved by God. You're not. Uh, and Jesus kind of burst that bubble in dramatic ways. 
So what about you? Do you want everyone to experience the life-changing love and truth of Jesus? Or is it really just for you and your family and your friends? See, the easy answer is we all want everybody to come to faith, but are we living it? Is it evidenced in how you treat the people around you? Is it evidenced in how easy it is for you to invite people to come to church with you, to meet your Savior? Is it, is it evidenced in how you invest in missions? Can I just tell you that, that one of the reasons I celebrate Calvary's generosity is because we live out what we say we believe about God caring for the nations, about God wanting people from every tribe and language and, and nation. Because as a church, we give 22% to missions, which means that every dollar you drop in the offering box, 22 cents comes out of that, we give it away. Because we want to see people from Havasu to the ends of the earth come to faith in Jesus Christ. But it doesn't stop there. As a church, we're generous beyond that. Because right now, as I speak, we are constructing a new church, Compassion International Center in Honduras. And it's going to feed and educate and encourage and help uh, with medical treatment for up to 300 children and families. And I just got back from Mozambique where I got to celebrate the fact that in the last three years, Calvary has provided 38 wells to, to people, uh, to villages that didn't have clean drinking water. See, that's generosity that I get to celebrate, and I hope you're celebrating it too, but it speaks to our commitment and our understanding that God loves everybody. Not just a few of us. His love really can be reckless. Uh, so the sower is reckless with the truth. And the sower will see a harvest. The sower will see a harvest. Look at verse 8 again. He says, Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. There's going to be a harvest. In other words, God is at work in this world and God is winning in this world. Let me say that again. God is at work in this world, and God is winning in this world. And, and, and if you read the Bible, which we want you to do, that's why we give them away, and if you believe the Bible, which I certainly hope you do, because here at Calvary we believe the Bible is the inspired, inerrant Word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live, but if you read it and believe it, then you know the reality that we win. We win. As followers of Jesus Christ, the victory is guaranteed. Just read the book. It's all in there. And, and sometimes it's easy to forget that God is working and winning in the world, isn't it? Especially when you read the headlines. You know, because, uh, you know, our post-Christian culture demeans faith and even labels biblical followers, you know, hate-filled uh, racists simply because we hold on to Scripture. It, it's easy to forget that uh, God is working and winning in this world and we see hate expressed in terrorism and school shootings and the political dialogue of the day. And yet God is still working and winning in this world. We hear of religious persecution. We see our own rights of religious freedom assaulted. And yet God is working and winning in the world. There's going to be a harvest See, God is changing lives. God is building churches. God is calling people to eternal life. And, and, he, and he's at work all over the world. And I want you to know, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus actually is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he really did die on the cross for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then you are called to be part of the harvest. You're called to be part of this whole episode of Jesus uh, working and winning in the world. Now, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, you can't say yes to all those things. You haven't committed yourself to following Jesus with your life. Then understand God is calling you to commit your life to following him. God is calling you to surrender to Jesus. He's calling you to, to embrace the reality that he is the hope for salvation. And if that's you, then please see one of us today. You know, the prayer team's going to be here at the end of the service at the front. Come and talk with them. Pray with them. Come find one of the pastors at the Connection Centers. We'd love to talk with you about your relationship with Jesus Christ because God is calling you. But if you're already a follower of Jesus, then God is calling you to be part of the mission, part of the harvest. So can I just take a moment and share a crazy vision 
for Calvary? I, I mean, this is one of those things that, that I, I hope you'll, you'll hear. Uh, we talk about it all the time. There's uh, about 40,000 unchurched people in Lake Havasu City. Uh, depending on the statistics you read, there's between five and 10,000 unchurched people in the Parker area. That's 45 to 50,000 unchurched people in the communities that we're present in. And we talk about that number. We know that our mission is to lead them to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. But here's my crazy vision for Calvary. I, I believe that in the next eight years that we can see 10% of the unchurched people in Havasu and Parker come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know how that hits you, but if you're not a math person, that's 4,500 to 5,000 people that confess Jesus and get baptized. And that's crazy. Can I just tell you that's crazy? Here's why it's crazy, because that's like double the number of people that we have baptized as a church in the last 27 years I've been pastor. Yeah, more than double that. So on one hand, I go, this is insane. Why in the world, what, you know, what kind of a goal is that? It, you know, is, is it just not even realistic? But then here's the other way I see this. Realistically, you know what that means? Realistically, that means that each one of us that regularly attends Calvary, if we just influence two people over the next eight years to follow Jesus, we'll reach that goal. That's, I mean, we've got over 2,000 people on an average weekend at our campuses, and if each one of us just leads two people to Christ in the next eight years, we've reached our goal. And, and so I look at one hand and I go, this is crazy. If we achieve this goal, uh, I mean, it, it, people will be, you know, talking about Calvary and all the stuff we're doing. And on the other hand, I go, we can do this. We can do this, but it, it, it's only going to happen if we, as the followers of Jesus, take up the mission of Jesus, say, I want to be a part of the harvest of Jesus because God is working and winning in the world. See, the sower is going to realize a harvest. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of it. So the first thing we see is the sower. And then, in this story, we see the soil. Right? The soil. I mean, that's really the recipient of the seed is the soil. The sower goes out to sow, and he talks about the soil in depth. Jesus talks about what happens to the seed that lands on different kinds of soil. And so, uh, I want you to understand, the soil is us. We're the people who are hearing the word of the kingdom the soil relates to me and you. Um, and this leads us to the moral of the story. And the moral of the story is, what kind of dirty mind do you have? Okay? Because according to Jesus, we all got a dirty mind. Right? Because we're the dirt. And it's how we receive the word of God. It's how we respond to the word of God. And, and so we need to hear Jesus. And I want you to answer the question. And, and, and hopefully in the next few minutes, you'll be able to go, uh, I think I know which kind of a dirty mind I have, but all of us got dirty minds. We just got to figure out if it's Jesus kind or not. So, uh, by the way, this is not for you to figure out what kind of minds other people have. You know, there's a, you need to go read Matthew chapter 7, the first couple of verses, if that's your inclination. Well, I'm going to figure out what my husband has, or my wife has, or my kids have. or my. No, this is for you to kind of figure out what kind of soil you are and what kind of dirty mind you have. So um, the first kind that Jesus talks about is the path. And that's a closed mind. Right? Look at verse 19 again. Jesus says, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. So the dirty mind of the path is one that is hard and unrelenting. It's somebody that's already got their mind made up. Don't bother them with the facts. Don't bring any new ideas. They already know everything, and you can't change anything. They're not open to learning. They're not open to changing. They're not open to growing. And they're not willing to let God change their mind. I'm pretty sure none of you have ever been in that place of a closed mind. Uh, I'm sure none of you have ever been in that place when you're arguing with your spouse or your kids or your parents that you've had a closed mind and your way was the only way you could see anything. We need to be careful that we don't have a closed mind to the Holy Spirit. 
Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul says, Do not be conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Hey, that's why we give Bibles away. We want you to have the Word of God. We want you to read the Word of God because we know that if you do that, if you engage the Word of God and you receive it, God will change your life. But if your mind is made up and you can't learn anything from God, then you're like the path. And your dirty mind is closed. Uh, following Jesus really takes root in our lives when we acknowledge we don't know it all. And we ask God to teach us. We ask the Holy Spirit to open up our eyes to see ourselves and to understand the Word of God. And, and we just ask God to teach us. So if your mind is closed to God, God's Word, you're playing into Satan's hands. That's exactly what he wants. And, and if your mind has been closed to the gospel, to the truth of God, can I just challenge you to consider the truth of God today? God really does want to change your life. And he wants to give you life. But you've got to open your mind to him. So the first dirty mind is the path. It's closed. The second dirty mind is the rocky soil. And uh, that's afraid. That's afraid. Look at verse 20 and 21. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. Um, rocky minds love the message of grace and forgiveness. I mean, they just absolutely celebrate it. And they're excited that God loves them and that God adopts them as children. It, you know, this makes their day. Sometimes they're the most enthusiastic people that you meet. But they don't want the hard parts. They don't want the hard part. And when tribulation happens, when persecution arises, when there's trials because of their faith, or how about when God really leans into them and asks them to deny themselves? they drop out. You see, fear drives them from applying God's word to their life. That's what the rocky soil is all about. It's about fear. But, but if I do that, if I live for God, if, if, if I really commit, then my family's going to think I'm a fanatic. And, and what are they going to say to me on social media when I identify as a Christ follower and, and start, you know, sharing my, my beliefs? I mean, are people going to unfriend me? You know, what about, uh, you know, if I really follow Jesus, is it dangerous? Will I have to sacrifice? Will Pastor Chad ask me to go on a mission trip? You see, fear is the enemy of faith. Fear is always the enemy of faith. Fear wants you to, to not change, to not follow, to not listen because you don't know what will happen. Except here's the promise. Jesus said, I'm going to lead you. I'm going to be with you. Uh, and, and it's going to be great. Doesn't mean it won't hurt. Doesn't mean that, you know, that you won't suffer because suffering's part of it. Jesus said, if the world hated me, it's going to hate you. He kind of told us those things. But, but here's the thing. Fear is always the enemy of faith. Think about it. I mean, we're in October now, so that means it's Christmas season, right? Stores are trying to decorate and everything like that. Uh, and and uh, we all love the Christmas story, and even if you don't know it all that well, but there's angels in the Christmas story, and they show up, and every time the angels show up, you know what they say? First thing out of their mouth, do not be afraid. Now, I realize that's because people are freaking out if an angel shows up and starts talking to you, but, but that's the message of Christmas. That's the message of hope. That's the message of God. Do not be afraid. The Apostle Paul, who knew a whole lot about persecution and about suffering uh, and about pain, said this. He's writing to, to, to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1. He says, For we have not been given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. We're not, we're not supposed to be afraid. We're supposed to be powerful and loving and, and controlling ourselves. But the dirty mind that is rocky is afraid. Is afraid. So the dirty mind that is the path is closed. The dirty mind that is rocky is afraid. And the dirty mind that is filled with thorns is distracted. Thorns is distracted. Look at verse 22. 
Jesus says, as for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Proves unfruitful. Okay, so thorns are people who love Jesus. They're excited about God's mercy. They're excited about God's redemption. But, there's always that but. But they take their minds and their eyes off of Jesus, and they get distracted by the issues of life and by money. Okay? They, they get distracted. You know, you want to commit. You really want to commit. You really have great intentions, but, you know, my schedule just doesn't let me do it. I'm just too busy. Maybe later I'll have time. And people, when they're young, they go, well, when I retire, I'll have time to serve God. And then people who are retired are like, oh, I don't know how I had, had time to work now that I'm retired. I, I'm busier than I ever was. You know, either Jesus is a priority or he's not. So we make excuses and, and we let the issues of life get in the way. Or we let money get in the way. Because maybe you like the loving part and the sharing part and the serving part of Jesus. But you really resist the generosity part. And, and by the way, I read this this week, and uh, again, I don't remember who quoted it originally, but I've heard it so many times. If you're not generous when you're poor, you won't be generous when you're rich. Right? Everybody always says, oh, if I win the lottery, I'm going to give, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And, you know, I always say, yeah, sure, you know, pay off the debt, build us buildings, we'll, you know, use it in the mission, great. But here's the reality. If you're not generous when you don't have, you won't be generous when you do have. You'll just have more stuff to be selfish with. See, generosity is about attitude. It's not about resources. Generosity is all about our heart. It's not about our resources. So we're always, you know, justifying, ignoring Jesus' commands based on, you know, our practical concerns. And I've heard people say things like, God wouldn't really expect my family to do without Woody. God, God wouldn't expect me to force my kids to go to church. I mean, God wouldn't expect me to, you know, go to church every Sunday. I mean, it's my only day off. I... You see, good intentions that are distracted by life prevent us from following Jesus and being fruitful. Good intentions that are distracted by the love of money result in fruitlessness. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, no one can serve two masters. He's going to love the one and hate the other. He's going to cling to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and money. Can't happen. So you've got the, the dirty mind of the path that is closed. You've got the dirty mind of the, the rocky soil that's afraid. You've got the dirty mind of the thorns, which is distracted. And then Jesus tells us about the dirty mind that is productive. That's the obedient mind. Verse 23 it says, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. And he indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, in another thirty. The productive soil is the obedient person. This is the person who hears what Jesus says, who believes what Jesus says, and then applies God's word to their lives so that they are changed. Uh, um, but you do what Jesus says, even when it's hard, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's costly. You read the Bible, you listen to sermons, you, you change your life based on what God commands. And, and th this is not easy, but it is what leads to a productive life. And your life becomes productive. Uh, it starts producing the fruit of the Spirit. You know, the Apostle Paul describes that in Galatians 5 when he says, For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He says, against such things as these, there isn't any need for law. Because you're, you're living the, the Christ life out. And everybody I know wants those fruit of the Spirit in their lives. Everybody wants more love in their life. They want joy in their life. They want to have peace. I don't know about patience, but we all need it. 
See, we all want that, that, that fruit of the Spirit, but the only way we get that fruit of the Spirit is by listening to Jesus and applying His teaching to our lives so that we change, and it's never comfortable. Uh, I don't know about you. I don't know if, if in your life you can identify points in time when God has just said, hey, I want you to change this. Uh, but the first one that really uh, God convicted me about, uh, I was 17. I had said God's called me to be a, a pastor. Uh, I was starting to prepare for ministry. I started reading the Bible a whole bunch. And, uh, and God confronted me about the way that I talked. He just said, you really can't represent me uh, unless you speak in a way that, that honors me. And it was Ephesians 4 and 5, uh, several passages there that, that really God just said, you can't go on talking like you're talking. And I remember as a 17-year-old thinking, how am I going to stop, you know, talking the way that teenagers talk, the way that I, I was talking? And, and you know, what I actually had to do is I actually kind of had to like just go, I have to stop talking, period. I had to like fast from talking, you know, only what was necessary. My friends thought something was wrong with me. The people I worked with thought something was wrong with me. And I was just trying to go, okay, God, I'm going to give you my tongue because if I'm going to speak for you, then I need to surrender to you. And it was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. Because you guys might notice I like to talk. <laughs> and I've got kind of a quick tongue. And a playful sense of humor. And that's what would get me in trouble and still does. Uh, but... Uh, but it means that we have to do what Jesus says, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, even when it's costly. If we want that fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Because um, we've got to have a productive, dirty mind. And then if we surrender ourselves to God and, we've, and we apply His Word to our lives, something else happens in our lives. Uh, we begin to bear the fruit of influence on other people. We, we, our lives start making a difference because we start pointing people to Jesus. We start living out that, that faith and people are drawn to Christ. And, and, uh, and, and we all want that, but it only happens when we are in that productive place where we're obeying God. You know, we, 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 we want to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. I, I challenged you earlier saying, hey, if every one of us in the church would, you know, just influence two people over the next eight years, we'd make this amazing goal of seeing 10% of our community come to faith in Jesus. But that's only going to happen if we start obeying Jesus. If we really have that productive, dirty mind. Then, and some of you already have it because some of you are already like, I know my two. I'm going after them and I'm going to get them this year. <laughs> because you're already focused on that. God's already spoke to you. You've already got people's, you know, in, in your mind that you're praying for. Some of you have already been praying for people and working on people. And, and so you're already focused on that. But it only happens when we're obedient. And I'm guessing that every one of us knows what God wants us to do in our lives. At least the next step. The Spirit's already convicting. So what kind of dirty mind do you have? I hope and pray that you wrestle with that this coming week. And maybe you'll read this again and kind of go, here's where I am. Got to get honest with God because he wants to be honest with you. And then you need to decide, what kind of dirty mind do you want? And then invite God to change you. You see, the choice is yours and yours alone. I know what kind of church I want us to be, but we're really going to be the kind of church that we decide to be as individual followers of Jesus. Because the sower is sowing the seed. God is working and winning in this world. You've got to decide if you're going to join him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you love us the way that you do. Your, your love is amazing and, and the fact that you desire every person Every person in this room, every person in this city, every person in, in, in the communities that we're in, every person in the state, in this country, in this world, to come to faith in Jesus is wonderful. And Father, my first prayer is for anyone in this room right now who hasn't made that commitment to follow Jesus, I pray you'd speak to them, you'd call their name, they'd hear you, and they would surrender to Jesus today. Father, for the rest of us who know you as Savior and Lord, I pray that you would call us to that productive soil.
that we would take those steps of obedience, that we would lay aside our fears, we lay aside the distractions, and we would take hold of Jesus like never before. God, you're working in this world. You're, you're winning in this world. You've got a harvest going on in this world. We want desperately to be a part of it. So help us to see those people around us that need you. And help us to start praying and inviting and encouraging them to follow Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.